production and consumption. The purpose of this lecture is to review how production and consumption have developed in the past 500 years of European history. The two topics are closely related. They mutually influence each other. With this, we can examine central themes of the economic history of Europe, like economic growth, the process of industrialization, and the development of consumer society. One of the defining features of the early modern era in Europe was economic development. Between the 14th and 18th centuries, changes in the way that good, goods were produced, exchanged, purchased, and consumed had a huge impact on the lives of all European men and women and significant ramification for European relations with other parts of the world. The concept of consumer society is a useful way of thinking about the range of economic change that characterized much of Europe before the onset of industrialization in the 19th century. The consumer society is a society in which significant numbers of people have at once the disposal means in cash or credit, opportunity through supply and retail, and desire, however constructed, to choose to purchase goods that they may or may not need. Many historians argue that consumer habits changed in the early modern period. As a result of numerous relevant works, at least two consensual conclusions have been reached. First of all, a basic observation. By the end of the 18th century, households and all of social levels through that Europe had more objects of more diverse kinds than they did around 1500. Second, some categories of product played a key role in this development. For example, cotton fabrics, exotic glossaries like pepper, tea, coffee, and cane sugar, ceramic tableware, Cooper cockware, and the small-scale metalworking products like clocks, scientific tools, or jewels. This development was made possible by the change in production. In the early modern period, European industrial producers achieved a small miracle. Many of their products became increasingly sophisticated, while at the same time, the prices of those products were decreasing steadily. As a result of these two developments, many industrial products that were only accessible to the richest class became available to ordinary people. Moreover, these cheap populous goods of the 18th century were often of a higher quality than their very expensive predecessors from the Middle Ages. One example is clocks and watches. In the beginning, clocks were big and expensive, but by 1800, they had become small and affordable. Another example is glass, which became used for a variety of purposes, including windows and mirrors, drinking vessels and glass beads. But similar stories can be told about books, paintings, skill, porcelain. What enabled artisans to achieve these improvements? One important factor must have been apprenticeships. Craft were taught individually under a contract settled between a master craftsman and his or her apprentice. Guilds were increasingly setting rules for the training of young artisans, and gradually a model emerged that was followed for apprenticeships. Moreover, apprentices' travel and the migration of artisans ensured that the best practices were shared between production centers. Another factor was the emergence of craft manuals. After the invention of print in the middle of the 15th century, craft manuals multiplied and became very popular. Contributing to this popularity 
were the increasing number of literate craftsmen and women. Those who had acquired the necessary skills could improve them by reading craft manuals. Additionally, such books were increasingly illustrated, allowing the reader to see what the often complicated instructions amounted to. Together, illustrations, tags, and practical instruction helped craftsmen and women to improve their working practices. Some additional factors also influenced the nature, variety, and supply of goods in the early modern period. One was commercialization, the development of trading institutions and networks within Europe that facilitated the exchange of commodities. Another was commerce and colonization beyond Europe. The expansion of Portugal and Spain into the Atlantic and Ocean and Indian Oceans introduced new commodities like potatoes, tomatoes, tobacco, and chocolate into European diets and used colonial slave work to increase the supply of traditional luxuries like silver, sugar, and spices. These methods of armed commerce, colonization, and slavery were then adopted by the Dutch, French, and English, transforming Europe's world of goods in the process. In addition to the indigenous development in production, then intensification in both European commerce and global expansion contributed to the increasing supply and availability of consumables before the 19th century. Cities and towns were deeply implicated in all these developments, serving as centers of manufacture and commerce. Cities and towns were center of retail and consumption as the changing and increasing demand for goods among different social groups was just as important. Before the 19th century, Europeans consolidated their position in the world economy and accumulated wealth without producing goods of particular interest to other parts of the world, instead enriching itself by trading products. This changed radically with industrialization, initially located in the uh, areas along the Atlantic coast, but soon affected even the most distant corners of the European continent. The spread of industrialization and modern economic growth were phenomena of the 19th century. Economic historians generally interpret the 19th century as a period making decisive a transition from the traditional growth model to modern economic growth. The traditional growth model corresponded with Malthusian principles, named after the e uh, English economist Thomas Robert Malthus, which means that economic growth was tied to population growth due to relatively stable labor productivity and population growth was limited by available resources. In contrast to the traditional model, the modern economic growth is based on rapid acceleration in the efficiency of production and significant structural changes, like shifts from agriculture to industry and services. It was only the combination of industrialization and capitalism that really triggered the historically unprecedented era of continuous economic growth in Europe. Economic historians have recently corrected the often exaggerated estimation of uh, scale of growth, and they argue that the change was gradual and evolutionary rather than revolutionary in nature. That is why industrialization rather than industrial revolution is a more appropriate term for the process. The transition to sustained modern economic growth spread across the continent, first from Britain to Western Europe. Beginning from the 1840s, Western European countries all launched their particular version of industrialization. In Southern and Eastern Europe, however, 
growth remained limited until the late 19th century. Besides the spatial differentiation, growth also showed considerable variation over time. The stabilization of modern economic growth on the continent brought steeper swings. The decline between the mid 1870s and the mid 1890s, the period which is called Long Depression, was substituted by rapid growth associated with high inflation prior to the First World War. The latter period is known as Bell Epoch. Modern economic growth was made possible by industrial capitalism, one of the pillars of which was the transformation of production, the industrialization. European countries did not progress in industrialization at the same time, at the same pace, or in the same way. But in one way or another, the change had already reached all European regions. Before industrialization, the population had mainly lived from agriculture. As part of the development, people took jobs in industry in increasing numbers, and the relative importance of industry in production grew. Industrialization is thus a phenomenon of both social and economic transformation. As a result of industrialization, productivity increased significantly. In the 19th century, a worker produced more products in the same amount of time relative to earlier periods. One source of productivity growth was the division of labor and specialization. The effect of the division of labor on production was already drawn attention by the English economist Adam Smith. What he witnessed in Britain in the 18th century became a common phenomenon in the 19th century in other parts of Europe. Beside the division of labor, another reason for the improvements in productivity were technical developments. Scientific and technological innovation spread through the economy. During the 19th century, slowly, all sectors of the economy were transformed by technical developments even beyond industrial production itself. The invention of steam engine is a good example of how the impact of innovation spread. The steam engine enabled mechanized mass production in industry, but transport and trade were also revolutionized by its use in the steamboat and in the steam locomotive. And agriculture production was also transformed by the steam plow, which enabled the mechanization of plowing and by the steam threshing machine, which enabled the mechanization of grain threshing. In fact, without an increase in agriculture productivity, industrialization would not have been possible. When agriculture productivity improved, even fewer hands were necessary to increase in agriculture production, which in turn rendered additional agriculture worker surplus. The development of agriculture productivity was made possible by crop rotation, the use of iron tools, seed selection, stable livestock farming, fertilization, and the mechanization of certain workplaces. The industrial production also underwent significant transformation during industrialization. Former handicraft production was gradually replaced by the manufacturing industry, and from the beginning of the 19th century, an increasing number of factories appeared. Factory production as a new institutional form of production meant a division of labor, mechanized production with a much larger number of workers, and using machines driven by steam power, later by electricity. Factories also enabled the mass production of goods, which reduced the price of industrial products and made them available to a wider range of consumers. In addition to this new way of production required 
much more financial resources. The higher need for capital in the age of industrialization resulted in the spread of joint stock companies, where the cost and the risk of production were shared among several shareholders. The joint stock company was important not only as a new source of capital, but as an institutional innovation. The division of labor and the specialization of all work processes characterize the operation of a joint stock company. This also allows effectiveness in highly complex workflows and diverse activities, such as the mass production of a wide variety of products or simultaneous sales on different markets. In the age of industrialization, the growing capital needs together with escalating risk and production brought to life the modern banking and insurance sector. During the 19th century, the range of activities of credit institutions and insurance companies considerably grew. When it comes to consumption, we should state that cross-border markets and modern European consumer societies started to emerge much earlier, although the process became more intense in the 19th century. Mass consumption became an increasingly everyday reality and necessitated the purchase of almost all household goods, including food, clothes, pottery, and toiletries. While small shops emerged everywhere, particularly in those areas where people lived in proximity, warehouses were built in the outer quarters. Towards the mid 19th century, department stores opened in big cities and metropoles. Fashionable department stores, such as Aubemarche in Paris, presented wide assortments of both everyday and luxury goods. Even for those not well off enough to afford these goods, window shopping became a cherished pastime. Those who could not save enough to buy the objects of logging were increasingly relying on credit. From the mid 19th century onwards, the first consumer credit models were also offered, mostly be obtained in small shops, but slowly credit associations and other financial brokers also joined this new market. This process was accompanied by new marketing techniques and shifts in advertising. The rise of the print media in the second half of the 19th century offered new ways to publicize consumer goods and create object of blogging for consumers. Fancy packaging, or artsy and colorful presentation of goods in newspapers and magazines helped shape distinct consumer societies in Europe and created more complex business cycles involving a growing variety of professions. While many goods were still mostly affordable only for the middle and upper classes, being a part of the emerging consumer society was no longer a privilege for the rich. Throughout the 19th century, consuming became something that defined and shaped the everyday life of European citizens in the cities as well as in the countryside. Consumerism became an integrative force, both connecting and distinguishing European across social strata. Summing up the performance of the European economies in terms of production and consumption during the 20th century is not an easy task. Trends have varied considerably over certain periods, and not least because after 1917, two economic systems coexisted in Europe, and between 1947 and 1991, the Soviet system was imposed on many countries. The 20th century was a time of rapid growth in Europe, and as a result, there was a pro process of convergence in the second half of the century between European countries 
and the other rich economies of the world. The high growth rates of European economies in the 20th century reflect both the availability of new sources of energy, especially oil and raw materials imported from other continents, as well as rapid technological progress. However, growth was not continuous. European economies grew less in the interwar years, but witnessed the most rapid economic growth in the 1950s and 60s. The broadest structural changes in production in the capitalist countries during the 20th century were first, an enormous increase in both agriculture and industrial production, and second, a shift in the workforce from agriculture towards the industry and later services. These changes had their roots in the 19th century, but gained new spread after the First World War. Throughout the century, the increase in agriculture production was followed by a decrease in employment shares. The sharp decline in the agriculture workforce was both cause and effect of technologization progresses, processes like irrigation, tractors, hybrid seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides. Supported by considerable state protection and investment, agriculture production reached its peak in Western Europe in the 1980s. Although during the 1920s, industrial production quickly surpassed pre-war levels, in the 1930s, the Great Depression hit industrial production in Europe hard. And the Second World War had also a devastating effect on many sectors. After the Second World War, industrial supply and demand started to boom, culminating in the golden age of the 1950s and 60s. Household appliances like refrigerators and microwaves, televisions and automobiles, together with processed processed food and leisure products were both driving and responding to new markets and societal changes. Efficiency and productivity became the magic words of these decades. Production and consumption were bound in an upward cycle. The energy crisis of the 1970s brought an end to this production boom a boom which came from sectors relying on cheap energy. Industry was forced to become more adaptive to changes, but this only increased the outflow of labor from the secondary to the tertiary sector. The even stronger internal market of the European Economic Community and later European Union concentrated high-tech industry within Europe, while outsourcing low-skill assembly industries to other regions like East Asia. In the 1920s, the Soviet Union began to build up a new production system and wanted to turn the underdeveloped rural country into a modern industrial economy. This attempt at modernization built on state ownership and planned economy instead of private ownership and market economy. Accordingly, land was nationalized and the factories became state-owned. Production was not driven by any supply and demand business plan, but by calculations and estimates presented by the central planning office, which created economic plans for specific periods, mostly for five years. These were then passed along to the production plans through compulsory plan directives. In the five-year plans, the development of heavy industry and military industry was given priority and agriculture became an inner colony from which income and labor could be reallocated to industry 
This economic model was exported by the Soviet Union to the territories that came under its influence after the Second World War. As a result of nationalizations and collectivization campaigns, private enterprises was almost completely eliminated. Priority was given to the development of heavy and military industry due to the tension of the Cold War. However, the planned economy soon proved that the state-owned enterprises only fulfilled the plans imposed on them quantitatively without enough attention to quality. All socialist countries experienced these problems of planned economy and the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, COMECON, did not help. However, from the 1960s on, the party leaderships made concessions to private craft, retail, and towards a so-called second economy in order to reduce social tension from time to time. Participation in the second economy necessary in the socialist era to produce products in short supply became for many a matter of survival. Patterns of consumption differed greatly if we are considering the first and the second half of the 20th century or the capitalist and the socialist part of Europe. Although consumption overall increased in the first half of the 20th century, it was not a linear process. Economic crises, such as the Great Depression, had disastrous effects. The two world wars and totalitarian regimes brought food shortages and rationing in most countries as well. Mass consumer societies therefore only fully emerged in the second half of the century. In line with economic growth, in increase in production and the expansion of the welfare state, household expenditure income in Western Europe significantly increased in the second half of the 20th century. As a result, larger sections of society were able to afford durable and expensive consumer goods such, such as telephones, televisions, and cars. The decades following the Second World War also saw shifts in expenditure from basic commodities such as food and clothing to non-essential goods like leisure expenditure, travel and transport. In the 1950s, in all socialist countries of Europe, industrial development gave priority to heavy industry with an emphasis on military industry. This Precedence decreased the relative importance of all other sectors and resulted in shortage of food and consumer goods. In order to build a socialist system, the party leadership expected socialist citizens to limit or postpone their consumption desires. Constant queuing, empty shelves, and chronic shortages of basic products became part of everyday life. After Stalin's death in 1953, the Iron Curtain became gradually more permeable and the perception of the West began to change. The proclaimed competition between the socialist and capitalist systems extended the consumption. From the 1960s, there was a rapid growth in mass consumption, giving households access to goods such as washing machines, vacuum cleaners, and televisions. Additionally, in the socialist countries, there was a wider supply of collective goods, for example, education facilities, cultural events, and sport facilities. While Great Britain had a clear leading role as a consumer society in Europe between the 1930s and 1990s, the years between the 1970s and 1990s also saw a great expansion of consumer goods in most Eastern and Western European countries. 
and the expansion in consumer goods did not come to an end in the 1970s, like the boom in production did. Looking back on the past 500 years of European history of production and consumption, one of the defining features was economic development. Changes in the way that goods were produced, exchanged, purchased, and consumed already began in the early modern period. Then, during the 19th century, the frameworks of production and consumption changed fundamentally. Specialization, a division of labor, techn technical innovations, and institutional changes increased production, while the age of industrialization also transformed consumption, forming a consumer society. As a result of industrialization and industrial capitalism, economic growth was able to step out of the Malthusian trap, and growth was no longer limited, but rose and fell in new economic cycles. Finally, the 20th century, especially its second half, was a time of rapid growth in Europe. In spite of all regional and chronological differences, all parts of Europe witnessed the same structural economic changes throughout the 20th century. The rise of industry and services at the expense of agriculture, the bloom of mass production, the shift from consumptive shortages to abundance, as well as the interdependence between Europe and the rest of the world. This is where the challenges of the 21st century come from. <laughs>